Hello, everybody. Randy Patterson here with Boomerosity. Obviously, you're a baby boomer. You wouldn't be watching this program. So you know the great song by the Youngbloods called Get Together. Well, the voice behind that song was a gentleman by the name of Jesse Colin Young, who, of course, re recorded, in addition to the Youngbloods catalog, a, a nice stellar body of work and his own solo work. And so it was a privilege I got to have just today to speak with Jesse about the 50th anniversary release of Song for Julie. And that album covers is what you see behind me. We had a great long talk. We reminisced about that album as well as the Youngblood work, especially Get Together. So what a thrill it was for me to be able to talk to this legendary, iconic man who made such a huge impact on the soundtrack of our youth. So I ask that you give this interview a full listen. I hope you share it with your friends. And I also hope that you subscribe to the YouTube channel or to the channel you're listening to uh, via podcast and uh, become a regular follower of Boomerosity. If you do that, we'll all be happy here. So without any further ado, here's my first interview with Jesse Colin Young. Until next time, this is Randy Patterson. Take care. Well, Jesse, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today. Well, my pleasure. So before we get into a, a whole bunch of questions that I'm sure you've been asked a time or two, and I try to make it interesting for you too, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, first of all, how's the, uh, how, how's, first of all, I want to thank you for all the years of great music and <laughs> from, you know, from your earliest solo work to the young bloods to your later solo work till now. Wow. You know, it's, it's pretty, it must feel amazing to be able to turn on the radio every day and hear something of your work being played somewhere. Yeah, it is. Um, I always said when they were passing out jobs, I got lucky. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's been a, it's been a joy for me. And it's a dream, I think, of every musician to be able to make a living and not have to work. Because most musicians are really, the, the majority of us are part-timers, guys who play on weekends and stuff, who keep live music going. Yep. Uh, and I have been lucky enough to be a, a full-timer, and uh, it's been a joy. Well. Your music has been a joy. So thank you, like I said, for all the years of, of great music, man. It's, uh, I, I think you and your peers made the best music ever made. And, um, I'm just glad it was, it's part of my youth soundtrack and, uh, what I still enjoy listening to today. And now I get to talk to guys like you. So it's a double pleasure for me. Wonderful. So, so, uh, you know, again, before we get into this new re-release, sure. what's the uh, what's your post-pandemic world looking like these days, career-wise? Um, we went out last summer. I went out with my daughter Jazzy, who's you should check her out on Spotify, Jazzy Young. She okay. is a wonderful songwriter and has a beautiful voice. I've been. <clears throat> she was the last. She's the youngest, and I've been waiting for a child that kind of carried my mother's voice, whom she gave to me and my sister, actually, but it, it through. And Jazzy has a, a beautiful voice, uh, like her grandma. And, um, oh, when we played together and we toured, I, I went out solo. Um, and, and then Jazzy and I did some things together, and it was kind of... I had a feeling that touring for me may be coming toward its end. And I wanted, uh, after making Highways for Heroes um, during COVID, uh, kind of revisiting solo, I, I wanted to take it on the road one time. And so we did. And it was a lot of fun, just Connie, my wife and I, and Jazzy, and our two dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and the two dogs kind of would wrestle them during while we were both on stage. Uh, I don't know how she did this <laughs> <laughs> and bring them out at the end of the show just to kind of show folks, you know, it was a it was family. It was a family style show. And then we got COVID in the middle of the tour and we had to do some makeup dates. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, we did some last September <laughs> on I Got to Play in Golden Gate Park. Oh, for, wow. Although they paid me this time. But <laughs> to have the, oh, I, you know, and I played, I played there a lot. That's what drew me to San Francisco. Um, you know, the, the peace and love thing was really happening in the streets. People were smiling at each other. I was raised in New York. The people only used to smile there when they wanted <laughs> to ask you for some money, you know, on the street, <laughs> strangers. But right. everybody was smiling. And I said, these people can't all be high. This, this has to be <laughs> something bigger than just dope. And um, it was. But for me to be able to circle back after, well, I moved there in 67, so however many years that is, and sing to an audience that just came, came out to hear music, didn't have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, at this point, it's amazing. I mean, it would have to, it was, it's being funded by a, a very rich man who has passed on and left that legacy and enough money, I guess, in a, and his kids are involved in it now to keep it going. The, uh, you know, not, not strictly bluegrass, uh, festival. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just, it was the most beautiful tradition of that whole era. Yeah. And, uh, and for somebody to keep it going like that and devote his fortune to it is written. Yeah, I feel the same way about it. It is a treasure. Yeah. yeah. Free music. Yeah. yeah. Well, that area is, is so, I won't call it ground zero, but it was one of the ground zeros of what I call, you know, of the rock and roll movement. I mean, with, you know, the, there's so many hot spots of it in the 60s that just made mm -hmm. it. I mean, you can't think of Golden Gate Park without thinking, you know, love and flowers and yeah you and jefferson airplane and you know on and on and on you know that <laughs> just you know it, it brings back good memories and you know i i kind of wish we could bring some of that part back into today you know for as far as across society yeah you know, i know it wasn't all peace because there were protests and such but yeah, it would be kind of nice to have that frame of mind again, you know, society-wise. Yes, it'd be heavenly. It'd be absolutely heavenly because it was heavenly. It was a real, I mean, we touched down on June 15th. I had never been to San Francisco. I drove through it once at night mm -hmm. on my way to L.A. from Vancouver when I was promoting my second album, which was called Young Blood, mm -hmm. a folk album. Mm -hmm. and, but I had never, otherwise I'd never been there. And we came in and by God, Get Together was on the radio and people were smiling in the street and the Avalon Ballroom was full. And we thought, what are we doing in New York? We, <laughs> so we went home and finished the earth music and just moved to the Bay area. We saw it as a, a place we could work and live. Mm -hmm. Well, for me personally, you know, in addition to the music, one of the first interviews I did almost 15 years ago, when I first launched Boomerosity was with Sam mm -hmm. Andrews of big brother and the holding company. Mm -hmm. And I went up to his neck of the woods. I was actually, out there in San Jose for a, a meeting for my day job. I worked for one of the tech companies there back mm -hmm. then. And uh, after my last meeting, I hopped in the car and I drove up to, God, the, na the name slipped in my, time, in my mind right now, but it's up there near where Carlos Santana has a place and some of the others. But anyway, Sam was up there and we sat at a closed cafe outside on the, on the patio and I recorded it and just had a great visit and, uh, mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was doing, but he was very <laughs> gracious and very helpful and, uh, something I really treasured. And, 
you know, I when I hear any of the San Francisco music, the Bay Area music, man, I go right back to that conversation with Sam and yeah. you know, God rest his soul. I you know, he's still missed. But um so what drove you to re-release, remaster and re-release Song for Joy? Oh, just to mark its 50th anniversary. Um it was such a turning point for me. We kind of we wore the young bloods out, and it was a kind of a slowly wearing. After a while, um, toward the end, we had a bass player come on, so I could go back and play guitar. Michael, Michael uh, Kane, mm -hmm. who was a friend of Bananas from the, his Cambridge days, and um, and then we began to just do albums of oldies in our own studios. Um, and uh, I started keeping the songs. I just felt like it was time to move on for me. And um, that we weren't, you know, we weren't, we were almost like, this was like the end. That's why we were playing the songs that we grew, we were recording the songs we grew up with, mm -hmm. like Speedo. <laughs> And uh, it's great. Banana did the blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, it was kind of fun, but it was it was reminiscing because we were wrapping it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, with "Song for Julie," I had started playing with my brother-in-law, uh, Scotty Lawrence, keyboard player, and. Um, worked on an album called to, that eventually was called Together. It was an acoustic album. Um, and it came out, I guess it came out on Raccoon. Warners gave us our own label and we, we did a nice. lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Joe was always into jazz and he made a couple of jazz records and Banana. He was a bluegrass guy and he made, he took a local bluegrass band and in San Rafael and uh, made a couple albums with them. And I did this, it started in this little house and I don't, I had a little house, um, just a rental over Tamales Bay. So the bay was coming up right under the house and uh, with this 90 acre front yard, which had cows in it occasionally. And one of them ate, ate my motorcycle seat, which was phony leather. And I couldn't believe it when the cow ate that. And somehow I got a, uh, and I, I was trying to remember because I'm writing my, I'm writing my autobiography. Oh, how we got a, a little piano in there? And it must have been, it was a, must have been a really small upright. But we started recording there, I think. And I remember I had a four track and the four track was as big as a fridge. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and Scotty and I started recording there. And I think we, I think we got Creole Bell and a couple other things. And then I began to build the Ridgetop house and the studio that came after. So that project kind of went on hold and until we got the studio rolling, kind of rolling, just the building was up and, and, uh, I remember I graduated to, did I graduate to an eight track. Hmm. Yes, eventually. And it was, but it was one that I could just plug mics into because I didn't have a board. Mm -hmm. So I would just plug eight mics in. And uh, at that point, I was um, recording with Jeffrey Meyer, uh, who became my drummer. We called him Wolfman because he kind of looked like Lon Chaney in that. Uh, <laughs> and so the eight mics was enough, or we made it be enough. I was just playing acoustic guitar, uh, using a I was using, I think I was just using Youngblood's stage mics, which were mostly 57s and 56s. I didn't, I don't think I really had a, I didn't have a condenser mic at that point. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Yeah, so as we worked on that album, I be, I think I began to drift away and, and think like I gotta I gotta have an I'm gonna have a new band with this. I've been listening to Levon and I've been listening to Taj Mahal and thinking I want to do something a little funkier that were a lot funkier than the Young Bloods, mm -hmm. um, and. I think I, I want a saxophone. Ever since I heard a Stan Getz play with Astrud Gilberto, mm -hmm. I wanted somebody to play sax like that with, mm -hmm. as, as a second voice to me. And I think I was ready for that. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so Scotty knew, I guess Scotty, and, and then David Hayes joined a band on bass, beautiful bass player. Um, and they both knew Jim Rothermel and they said, Jess, you, you should, let's get Jimmy out here and you should hear him play with us and see, you know, and I, I fell in love and I realized, okay, this is it. This is the, this is the new band. This is the new, and, um, I had to bring the young buds to an end. And mm -hmm. so we started. So we started on something new in a, in this brand new little house that I built up there in the studio and um, new fellas to play with, new sounds. And of course, I'm, I'm learning to be my own engineer. I always <laughs> wanted to do this ever since when I first recorded at RCA in New York. They said now, don't touch the board. You can't touch the board. <laughs> forbidden fruit. <laughs> yes, forbidden fruit. And I really think I said myself, when I mean, someday I'm going to have my own board and I'm going to touch it in my one. <laughs> That's right. I mean, all those knobs. It's right. There's a lot, there was a lot to learn, but it was so exciting to be doing it and, and, you know, making tapes that I thought were were good for beginnings, mm -hmm. not really knowing what I was doing, just loving to plan with these guys. So we spent nine months doing that, and I financed the whole thing. I just paid the guys and because we didn't have, we spent a lot of time in the studio, and I don't know how, uh, but we didn't have to pay for studio time. <laughs> and um, it took nine months on and off to, to make that album and then because i wanted to shop i wanted to get the sound down and then i wanted to find a label that really loved it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um geffen was interested um clive davis and warner brothers so i i had a that's funny first first i went to see david geffen always admired him and he was our young blood's first agent and he mm -hmm. i guess was uh he was running Electra then, Electra Asylum, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, geez, I don't know, Jess, there's a, a, you use cheap echo. I said, geez, that's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I afford. I'm building a studio. And, um, and he said, there's no hit on this record. So there's no obvious hit. And... Um, And then I had a meeting with Clive and he, he liked it, but I don't know whether he seemed that enthusiastic. There's something about Warner Brothers would, after I met Mo and Joe, they, I, I kind of went to them last and, um, did I already have a, yes, I already had a relationship with them through through uh, Raccoon, because they had signed the Young Bloods to get me. Right. And now that I was going to go solo, I don't know. I felt at home there, mm -hmm. and um, that's probably why I. And they actually had a. Uh, a the first label I was at that had an artist's artist support a whole division of just 
support for artists mm. and what they're doing, their touring and their, um, I'd never known a label that really had that besides publicity. Yeah. They were wonderful. That was a great place to be. Very cool. Well, in putting the re-release together, were there, did some old memories come back as you were doing this remaster, this re-release? Was there anything oh, yeah. that's like, oh yeah, wow, I remember this now. I'd forgotten all about it. What, anything like that happened with you? Lots like that happened. I just wrote three pages yesterday for my autobiography on how we figured out how to build this building. So the Youngbloods were very um, kind of modest money makers. Mm -hmm. And um, all of a sudden, and in, in 1971 or something like that, um, Oh, 69 get together was, that was, was re-released and was a gold record. Mm -hmm. So I wrote the song on the flip side, beautiful. And I got this check for 25 grand. I mean, I'm drawing maybe $300 a week from the young bloods most of the time, except for record royalties. <clears throat> so I thought, wow, I'm going to build a house. And I found somebody who could build a house for that kind of money. And in the, in the end, I had to borrow a little, but not much. Mm -hmm. And then as the house was being finished, um, Three Dog Night put out sunlight. Mm -hmm. And I got another check for 25 grand. I said, I'm going to build a studio. <laughs> I mean, let me get them there next in this little gully. Uh, and uh, what a what a miracle that was because that studio survived the Mount Vision fire because it was down so low in this little gully that had a kind of a, a spring in it, mm -hmm. so it's wet, and it was low, and above it the forest was burning. With all these hundred foot trees, I asked a fireman, how can this be four scorched boards on the uh, on the deck? And my four story house is gone. I mean, it's just a pile of ash. Um, he said, yes, a very hot fire, all pine trees. He said, but all the, the way you trimmed your trees, um, Bishop Pines put out a lot of dead limbs as they grow. and I kind of trimmed all those off because they were like beautiful sculptures when you got rid of the dead lambs. Mm -hmm. So that put all the, the fuel for the fire up high. And he said, there must've been enough. So there wasn't any oxygen down here that, would, that was burning so hot and sucking up all the oxygen. So you're, I mean, cause when I walked in there and days after the fire and saw the forest, the whole ridge top is just smoldering ash with these, what, what, you know, with these 12 foot stumps left that were still smoldering that used to be hundred foot trees. And as far as you can see, that's what was there, <laughs> except wow. when you look over the lip, there was this little, there was my studio sitting there in the, in this burn up forest, hardly touched. Mm -hmm. I know um, my godson, Ethan Turner lives there, uh, Rick Turner's son and a uh, fellow who was a partner in the Lembic, <clears throat> that wonderful, made a lot of wonderful instruments in the Bay Area. And uh, he had gotten some water from this little endless pool that we had, and we had a, a pump onto the roof of the, of the house. Um, I guess we could just barely reach it. And between that and the fact that, but if the oxygen was there, uh, it would have been gone. Water, yeah, it would have been gone. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. And it, it sits there today. Um, actually two, three years ago, Jazzy did her first, some of her vocals on her first 
record. She did him up there with uh, with Ethan being her engineer, right? On the Ridgetop. Wow. Very cool. By the way, Ridgetop, I think, is my favorite song on the album. I love that song. And uh, I didn't know the story behind it until you just shared, you know, the story of Ridgetop and all that. I mean, I felt like it was obviously autobiographical, but, but uh, hearing your story just now just kind of fleshes that song a lot more to me, you know, so... Yes, Thank that's really, sharing. it's funny. One of my friends, a fellow who I played with in the basket houses, a man named Caesar Peters, um, he and I did a duo there when I was learning and we had, we had a rent strike and could afford to live on 10 or $15 a day. And um, he said, this is, this is you. This song is the you that I know. A little tough, you know, make um telling people I'm gonna make sure that the that the squirrels and and uh, I will be left alone uh, <laughs> and keeping the tourists at bay and so on and so forth. He said, mm -hmm. This is you, the way you love this place and and that 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 little bit hard nosed New York attitude of yours. <laughs> um, he said, This is more like you than some of your more romantic stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, cool. What's, uh, with, I mean, it's been out, what, a little over a week now or close to it. What's the, uh, what's the feedback back to you with the re-release? How is it, I mean, is it you getting a lot of nostalgic messages back to you from fans and family and friends? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been lovely. It's. It's there and it's and it's wonderful to celebrate it because it was the beginning of a whole new a whole new career for me. Wow. What do you think? Well, first of all, when you recorded the album back then and now you have this re-release, how has your outlook on the world, life, music, the music business changed between then and now? Well, yeah, I mean, Warner Brothers was kind of a dream come true. And uh, the deal that I made with them after they had the Youngbloods was, a, I think, a 15% of retail deal. Mm -hmm. When we started out at RCA, they paid the Youngbloods in the first year a, a percent and a half. <laughs> I mean, that's how they paid artists back then. And we, and we fought along with all the other artists who were, uh, who were not, um, you know, ready to accept the, uh, I mean, look, look at what we're going through right now with the strikes. Mm -hmm. It's funny. My grandpa is a union organizer, very active and a golden gloves boxer, which was a, a good idea for a, a union organizer around the turn of the century, but well, you better not fight. Um, and to see these unions actually having some success at getting a, a, at least a decent, if not a fair piece of the profit, at least a decent piece. Um, and I mean, I feel the same way about the auto workers, um, record profits and no raises. It's ridiculous. Yeah. The people who make the wheels go around need to share more, more deeply in the profits and these, and these people at the top who are making 27 million. They or more. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, I was just like, thinking of the government shutdown. I wonder what would happen if that included all of our lawmakers' salaries. As it should, if that <laughs> yes. were to happen. Yeah. You know? But anyway, but it's, you know, as far as the music side of it, I just, you know, you talked about the Youngbloods getting a point and a half there. <laughs> I mean, 
gosh, now the labels are doing these 360 deals and they're, they've got their hands into everything. And I just, you know, there's people like Joe Bonamassa now who's like, he owns it from soup to nuts on his own stuff. And I'm almost thinking that's the way artists need to go unless they can fall into a label that, like you were mentioning, that that was much more artist centric and had an artist heart about the business. I mean, you got to have business sense in, in this business or you won't be able to eat after a while. But, but there's, you know, I do feel like the profits are, are being hoarded and that artists, I mean, I'm speaking as a fan, I'm not a musician at mm-hmm. all. I play a mean air guitar and that's about it. But I, you know, as a fan, and I, I, I don't think I'm alone in this, Jesse, I, I feel like fans want to see artists successful. Yeah. We don't begrudge seeing some wealth with for our favorite artists because that kind of stokes dreams in us you know that wow you know i'm about to turn 64 so my dream days for the most part have have passed me and my hopes of being a musician you know i didn't practice so i how could i be a musician but to see guys like you still doing it and good ones coming up through the ranks we want to see you guys wealthy we want to see you doing well because that's the fruits of your labor. And we sure don't care anything about some faceless hack in a suit in a high rise somewhere, you know, flying the corporate jet everywhere he wants to go. You know, yeah. it's, we, we want to see you guys have it, you know? So I hope that those deals, the streaming deals, I understand the economics of streaming, but no, it's a, profits but it's, for that need to be yes. pushed it's, closer to the artist ridiculously tiny i don't know how i don't know how young people are going to do it i guess only on the road if if the and if they keep (laughs) yeah if they keep the labels from sticking their hands into their profits on the road um there's got to be a place for them and the streaming is ridiculous yeah well i mean it's wonderful for people listening I thought it was a miracle when my son showed me um, Spotify, and this was about five or six years ago. I said, um, you mean I can listen to these old blues guys just like right now, right here in the kitchen? <laughs> I don't have to. <laughs> you know, most of my records burned up in my house. I never replaced a lot of them. Uh, and I thought, oh, that's amazing. Um, but the cost of it for musicians is, I mean, I, at, at 15%, if I could sell three or 400,000 records, you know, I was making probably close to a dollar an album, Mm -hmm. um, or at least 75 cents or something. So that was some... That was enough money to pay for studios, buy some new microphones, pay mm-hmm. all the guys. I mean, I had a, in that band, eventually Rainbows Inc. was, um, it had insurance uh, um, for all the guys in the band, their wives and and their kids. Wow. The bookkeeper and his kid and, um, Yes, and also, uh, and profit sharing put aside for all of us in the um, in IRAs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, with the young bloods, it was all um, everything was equal. Mm-hmm. With our manager, with uh, the booking agents, even had a piece of the deal. Um, good, good lord! And by the time it trickled down to uh, us perhaps that's why it was so and uh that was the right thing to do at that time but i'm really um i like to sail my own ship and i do better as a with a lot of great help and i appreciate it and I take care of my people, but 
um, I don't want to be in a situation uh, as an artist where I have to get everyone to agree with me what the direction we're supposed to be going in or yeah or be stuck as it happened with the young bloods with all of our i think we all at the end of it we all came up with our we all wanted to go in different directions and and uh it just had to come apart yeah well on the young bloods uh, if i may i, I mm -hmm. i'm working on a um prototype for for a uh, make uh, that something that might go into syndication it's way too early to tell yet and one of the th parts of that may be you know others are doing it but i like to do it myself and that is a, a story behind the song but in this case what i would want to know i know you know the stories out there all over the place about how get together was done and that kind of thing what i'm after on this question is what is there anything unique I'm either bringing that song to be the hit that it was or after the songs come out? I, I know for me, yeah, I have Sirius XM. Um, they should pay me for that plug, by the way. And then they go, you know, I can flip through the channels, hit the oldie station, hit, you know, all the different ones. I have my presets and. I mean, Jesse, it just, it, it, you know, a week doesn't go by that I don't hear get together. I mean, that's one of that stable of just all time great classics that come on and you just feel good when you hear it, you know? And so I'm curious if there's any unique story either prior to its recording, during the recording or after that you like to share tied to that song, anything cool, any fan story that has come to you any unique something tied to that song well what I, it was it's what i went through I, um that song changed my life completely mm -hmm. um young bliss were playing at the cafe of gogo -Go, and we would open for whoever mm -hmm. i mean she, she just, i got to open for muddy waters and wow yeah that was a thrill i bet and, who was playing harmonica with him then? Oh, I be and we became friends. I started seeing him on the road. I forget. Oh, darn. Well, um, so I was in the village uh, on a Sunday walking home, and I thought I would pop into the and you know we were being paid twenty dollars a man for those shows, <laughs> and uh, most of us had wives and. Corbett had a kid and, uh, and, um, so that wasn't, but it was a, a free place to rehearse. So we were sharing with the blues project. We would share the rehearsal space. So uh, three or four days a week, we would have the whole day until maybe five o'clock. Nice. Yeah. And we had the stage and the monitors. We learned mm. you know, how to turn all that stuff on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, when we didn't have a sound man, just so I went. It was two flights down. I went down the first flight to the go go from uh, Bleecker. And I, I thought I heard music. And I said, Oh man, they got an open mic going on. And I normally would have just turned around and gone home and practiced because I. I'd only been playing bass for about 30 months, so I was doing a lot of catch-up practice on the bass because I had never played before, but we couldn't find a bass player. So I just, you know, I looked at McCartney and how he was doing it with the Beatles, and I thought, well, it, it must be able to be done. It's not, it felt a little foreign to me at first, but maybe that's because I all... Uh, in my vocal style, I often dragged the time, and I wondered how that <laughs> how that would work with a bass player. But somehow, I guess I made it work. And for some reason, and the reason was that Destiny was sitting there saying, "Jesse, you need to go down. Something's going on. 
you need to see it. So I went down, pushed through the beaded curtain there, and there was um, boy, this is the worst time of the afternoon for memory. <laughs> Buzzy Lenhart mm. singing Get Together. Um, and the song just just went through me like a like an arrow. And uh, I felt like I was in a movie about the Bible or something, and clouds were lifting and the <laughs> sun was coming out. And I, I mean, it was it was wild and psychedelic and it involved no drugs, just music. And that song just just said to me, you you've been headed in the wrong direction with this angry young man stuff. Um, this is it. This way is love, brother. Come on, try it. Sing me. I dare you. <laughs> so I ran backstage and uh, I got the lyrics from Buzzy and he wrote them out for me. I said, where'd that song come from? He said, well, Dino wrote that and, and, and taught it to everybody in the village, but he's already gone to San Francisco. So um, I did meet him years later out there. But, and I just took it home and practiced it and took it into rehearsal the next day. I played it on guitar, I played it on bass, and I went back and forth and, and, uh, when I was rehearsing it that day. And just, I loved it. Uh, and because it was a five and a half minute song, there was no pressure from the record company to make a hit out of it. Wow. And and they didn't exert much pressure like that, but there, it was just, it was an art piece. And I brought it to the band, you know, as, as something that I especially loved, almost more than I'm allowed to love this unabashedly because I didn't write it. Mm -hmm. um, I can love it as much as <laughs> I want to without seeming egotistical because it's right. someone else channeled this. I was I must have been busy at the time. Uh, <laughs> you know what's kind of a kind of a tough guy. So maybe he was a a guy like I was uh, being in those days and even um and I thought what a what a strange guy to bring this song about peace and love in, uh, but uh, God bless him, he, what a job he did. So I really think it's the love. Um, I remember somebody saying to me from a radio, from a BAI, which is a radio station in New York, it's the, it's the NPR station. Um, he said, there's something pure about this recording. Mm -hmm. He said that, that the other recordings of this song, because of, uh, you know, Kingston Trio recorded it, it made it sound a little like the Sloop John B. Um, and the airplane recorded it and the Mata Hoople. And uh, uh, yeah, and I think, I think that purity is that, I I think the way they play together, I think at least Jerry and Banana, who were not the best of pals, <laughs> but they play so beautifully together on this. I think the love that the song brings forward, plus my love of it, the way that we brought it, that Jed, it just, just the band really came together. I wouldn't be surprised if Joe loved it too. Um, yeah, it's, and that love and, and that time and that freedom to just do whatever, because it's not three minutes and we can't possibly make a single out of it, which right. proved to be. So the one more miraculous thing was Augie Bloom was the 
head of promotion at RCA. And in 1969, he, after, after it was out in 67 and, and we were able to just like go into San Francisco with a record on the radio because it was a hit there. I mean, it was the summer of love. It was the perfect mm -hmm. song. Mm -hmm. Um, he went back to them in 1969 and said, not the country is ready for this song now in June. And he said, I want to re-release it. And they said, Augie, we don't do that. We don't do that here at RCA. And he says, you're going to do it or you're going to do without me. Mm. Took him like two hours. <laughs> Augie was, Augie was the best. <laughs> said, okay, Augie, okay, okay. We surrender. Go ahead. You know, put it out. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Glad he did. Glad he did. So what are you doing after this? What are you, as far as, you know, you've got this album coming out, you've got some activity around that. Um, mm -hmm. you got any new music coming out? Anything else you're going to do? You know, I know you're doing the occasional gig and such. Are you, um, are you, are you going to tour? New album with new music, anything like that? No. No, I'm writing this. I'm writing the book. I went out to, we got COVID touring and then, uh, we made it to LA and we kind of recuperated Connie and I, and we had driven this, <laughs> we had bought a motor home and, uh, driven. I don't think I've ever driven across the country without stopping to play somewhere. That's so we, we had done this and then, so driving back, I guess proved to be too. So we got COVID again, by the time we got home, we had it again. And, uh, that kind of wiped me out. So when we did the when we did the final makeup dates and I got to play Santa Barbara at the Libero Theater, which I have wanted to do for 20 years. And, uh, and there were a couple other dates and I realized at the end, only three dates. And I listened to the tapes of them and I said, geez, you know, I, I don't have the strength to do this, even three shows. I mean, I have to, I have to be able to deliver like mm, 85, 90% of my best every time. And I have been able to do that my whole life. But I said, I'm not strong enough right now. Physically, I don't have the, just, just driving around and, <clears throat> and, um, eating restaurant food and yeah. not sleeping in your own bed. And it just was yeah. too much. And I said, well, Maybe I should just stay home this year and um, and finish the book. I mean, th there's a lot of finishing in there. Yeah. I would say I'm, maybe I'm, luckily, I'm 25% in. So it's, it's, it's a lot of work. And I, yeah, it is. I've always avoided it <clears throat> because I knew it would be a lot of work. <laughs> um, but I thought, well, this is a perfect time. I need something to do, but I, I can't travel and play. I don't have it. And I don't want, after all the years that I had brought, been able to physically bring the, bring the best to people. Mm -hmm. I've seen the guys my age go out there whose voices are gone and stuff and, or whose, you know, whose energy is gone and it's, just sad and I refuse to be one of those guys if I can get my strength back then my touring days are over yeah but we are doing a few there's a movie that we made while we were making sometime during that year you know it was a September to June thing um that we worked on song for Julie just on our own with no record company with no nobody booking us um and i don't know i forgot where i was going a movie being made oh yeah, yeah. so yeah. my neighbor the architect who designed my house 
lived right down the road. And he said, I want to make a movie of you guys and we're going to put up the money and we are going to hire hero Narita who was in the Bay area at that time. I don't know whether hero heroes exactly my age. I just finally got a hold of him. He's, he's in Petaluma now. And because we're going to show the movie, we never released it. It's like a, it's like a very sweet um, documentary. You know, we had little kids. We're, you know, we're, we're living on this ridge top. Um, the band is like a, a family. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he thought that was worth making a. He he almost said, "Couldn't you get in a fight with your wife or something?" We got so much sweetness going on. <laughs> he said, "Yeah, that happens, but we're not doing it on film." <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, so he made this fifty—I don't know, fifty-five-minute movie, and it's—I uh, haven't seen it in a long time. I I can't wait to see it again because the kids are so little and so cute and. And there's probably some good stuff in there because it, it was such an exciting time. Mm -hmm. So we're going to show the movie um, in San Francisco at the, uh, there's, a, there's an art center. Um, and I haven't learned the name of it yet. We're at the, and in LA at the, um, at the Grammy Museum. Oh, cool. And uh, then we do a and a I guess, and and uh, then I play, you know, four or five songs at the end, acoustic. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to do those two things and a couple, uh, and then go to the, go to the library. These, are, uh, this is like, mm, you know, part of this is me wrapping things up. Uh, I understand. Uh, yeah. And um, there's some interest in the state library of having, so, so much of this music was written in California, mm -hmm. of having it, of them making a, in Sacramento, of them making a, a little Jesse collection of the, the records that we did with the Youngbloods and myself and mm -hmm. movie and... Uh, I don't know what else. We don't have a lot of, because the house burned down in 95. We don't have a lot of memorabilia. Yeah. Yeah, you know, a lot of stuff. So it'll be a very gentle, oh, and I'm also doing a show, a little short show like that, five or six songs with Taj Mahal. Oh, nice. To support, this is at the Sweetwater in Mill Valley. And of course, I'm, that's my that's part of my home. Mm -hmm. um, there's a movie about a great radio station called WHFS. It was in Washington, D.C. And it was owned by a family, the Einsteins. And Damien Einstein was my favorite buddy there. And every mm -hmm. time I would come to town, he would just, I, I'd go over there to see him and he just put me on the air live. If I had a band, well, I mean, I can remember the drums would be out in the hallway of the, you know, radio stations. That usually the the studios are very small. There's no room for a drum kit in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the drums were in the hall, and the huh. yeah, when this band first started out, and they did this for everybody. Um, mm -hmm. And it's called the movie is called Feast Your Ears. So it's being shown at the Mill Valley Film Festival. And the the day that it's being shown, Ta Taj and I are playing a, uh, I don't know what him, I'm playing a short set to open that show. And then they're, they've got some of the DJs from KSAN and also from HFS um, to come and do a whole hist history thing about how it happened and what it felt like. And yeah. Very and, nice. Very nice. Taj and I will sing get together together. Cool. I love Taj. 
I uh, I hope I, I look forward to your book, Jesse. And when that comes out or just before it comes out, let's do one of these again yeah. and talk about that book and some uh, some of your other memories on there. But before, before I let you go, I want to ask you one last question. Hmm. And that is, and it, I'm sure you've been asked it a time or two over your career, but I want to kind of get your pulse on it today. And that is, what do you hope your legacy uh, will be? And, and how do you want to be remembered when it's all said and done? Hmm. I gosh, I hope there's enough love in the music to be, be remembered as a man who loved the earth hmm. and loved his fellow beings and uh, gave his best and shared uh, shared his love with people through music. That's really, I've always felt like I was a reporter, really. Hmm. And especially when we were in the throes of the generations, um, I don't know what I'd be reporting on now. There's, it's hard to. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm always looking for that. There's this, there's one newspaper that just does good news. And I'm oh, always... I love that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's those um, are rare. <laughs> yeah, you know, once we were in Hawaii after we were burned out, we had this little house in Hawaii, and we moved there. We were so lucky to have a spare house. Boy, when your house burns to the ground, you lose everything. It is, man, it's like being run over or something. Mm -hmm. It's tough. And um, I remember Connie went out and bought a backpack. She said, God damn it, I'm not, I'm not, never going to own more than fits in this backpack again. Because she had just spent three years redoing my, my little modest house and making it really beautiful and... Mm -hmm. And they adding a guest house and God, it all just, it disappeared in that fire, mm. just into a pile of ash. Um, and where was I going with that? I'm sorry, I lost. That's okay. We we're talking about remembered and, and legacy, how you want to be remembered and your legacy. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm in a Hawaii. Walled school this morning and and says they've got a great Waldorf in the garden. Let's Waldorf school K through eight, and um, you know, so the kids and I would, oh, where's mom? And one of them say she's in a meeting, and we all laughed and ha ah, because that was takes a lot of meetings to build a Waldorf school. So I did a lot of laundry in those days. And especially in the first year, she asked me not to, not to go on the road after the fire for a year, stay home and get the kids, you know, cause here we are all of a sudden we're living in Hawaii and their friends are across the ocean and you mm -hmm. know, they're making new life. And it turned out to be a pretty cool life, but, um, uh, so I'm home, I'm doing the laundry. That's my favorite part of housework. I, I like, and I'm folding the laundry, I'm under the house, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, this needs to be done. This laundry needs to be done, and peace needs to come. And somewhere out there, right now, in the world, get-togethers on the radio, and people are being touched by it, and it's doing the work of, of peace. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm here folding the laundry, which is also important. <laughs> uh, hmm. Yeah. I think I realized then that I had done it, that if, if only that song survives of all, all my work, that, um, what a wonderful legacy that song is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jesse, this was a lot of fun. Thank you for taking the time. You've been very generous with your time, very gracious. And um, it's an honor to speak with you after all these years of hearing your music and especially get together. Wow. What, what a personal thrill that is for me. So um, 
I look forward to when your book comes out. And like I said, I want to have Thanks. another one of these with you so we can just sit and talk about that. And uh, I'll buy one from you and hopefully you can sign <laughs> it for me and I'll add it to my signed collection that goes nowhere, but stays right in my <laughs> office here. But um, Good. please continue to stay yeah. well and uh, I'll let you know when this uh, piece posts and it'll be on YouTube and podcast and on my website and it, all all those good places. So um, again, thank you. And uh, we'll be talking to you down the road. All right. I got some work to do. Yep. All right. Take care. (laughs) You too. Bye-bye. This show was edited and produced by Mike McClellan. The original music, Roll the Dice, was written and produced by Quentin Hope. And Randy Patterson was your host and executive producer. (laughs) 